this video will be useful for two groups of people. Those who have a general understanding of the lore behind sorcery, and those who are confused by it. I will lay out the basics regarding the history and practice of sorcery for the beginners, and then I will use that information to try and give some of the veterans of Elden Ring lore something to think about. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. The best place to start is with Sorceress Selen, who we find in the Waypoint Ruins in Limgrave. She reveals the two most essential elements of sorcery and the study thereof. One, the art of sorcery draws upon the powers embedded in Glintstone. And two, sorcery is the study of the stars and the life therein. These two elements, glintstone and stars, are of particular interest to sorcerers because of the amber that resides within both. According to Selen, there are two types of amber, golden amber and glintstone amber. Golden amber contains the remnants of ancient life and houses its vitality. The golden amber that we find in the lands between appears to have been brought there by the Elden Beast. The description for the Elden Star's incantation proves this, quote, It is said that long ago, the Greater Will sent a golden star bearing a beast into the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring. I think it's safe to insinuate that the Elden Ring in its entirety is made of amber, given the fact that one particular piece of it, the Great Rune of the Unborn, takes the form of the Amber Egg, which has been used to birth several beings. All of this goes to show that the life-giving force inherent to a star is Golden Amber. In contrast, Glintstone, the Amber of the Cosmos, contains residual life, and thus the vitality of the stars. I would like to draw all of your attention to the word residual. The definition of residual is anything that remains after the greater part or quantity is gone. Based on all of this information, I theorize two things. On the one hand, it's possible that Glintstone is the form that Golden Amber takes when the gold inherent to it almost completely dissipates. When the Amber doesn't evolve into another form of life, but defaults into Glintstone. Because there is still residual Amber inside the Glintstone, the sorcerers can wield that Amber to birth animate and inanimate matter. Just as the amber in the Erd Tree or Renala's amber egg can be used to birth the life in all its forms, the residual amber in a glintstone can do the same thing, conjuring shards, blades, crystals, fire, and miniature stars. But there's another possibility, that Selen is just using the words amber of the cosmos for glintstone because she doesn't know how else to describe it. This would make Golden Amber and Glintstone different not in function, but in appearance and origin. I credit a patron and friend of mine, the Hour Man, for offering up that possibility. I will leave it up to you guys to decide for yourselves what the ultimate truth is here. Using Amber to conjure animate and inanimate matter has its utility, which is why the Academy of Raya Lucaria fostered it. Various disciplines sprung up within the Academy, differing in detail but all centered around the study of stars. The oldest discipline was the Caralos Conspectus, started by the sorcerer Azur. This discipline centered around the study of comets. One of Azur's peers, Lusat, started his own discipline, called the Olivenus Conspectus, which studied meteors. Other disciplines include the Lazuli Conspectus, which saw the moon as equal to the stars. As for the greatest students, they would be gifted the Twin Sage Crowns. They were the elites of the Academy, permitted to study and excel in sorceries of all kinds. Though the study of stars was promising, the Academy also realized that access to that power had to be limited. After all, the ability to conjure matter is the power of God. Putting the ultimate power of a god into the hands of mortals would produce disastrous results. Specifically, it would corrupt and destroy the mortals who tried to understand it or wield it, much like how the Flame of Frenzy drove all those who witnessed it to madness. So while the Academy forbid access to that ultimate power, they permitted access to limited power. They permitted the wielding of the limited amber inside of Glintstone. But any sorcery that attempted to wield the ultimate power of a star and the amber within 
was off limits. Selen, a former student at Raya Lucaria, felt that this kind of regulation stood in the way of true progress. She wanted, quote, glintstone sorceries that open our minds, unbound by terrestrial taboos. In order to do this, she would have to expel the Carrion royal family and restore something known as the Primeval Current. The true nature of the Primeval Current is still a mystery, but there are some clues that we can work off of. First, I would like to note the similarity of the word Primeval to another word that is used frequently in Elden Ring, that word being Primordial. If you watched my Elden Ring mythology video titled Ancient Dragons and the Crucible, you will recall that the word Primordial was used to describe the Crucible. The Crucible is the source of all life in Elden Ring. It is the place where all things began, which is why it is called Primordial. Now, depending on which linguist you talk to, the words Primordial and Primeval are either synonymous or have one small difference. Primordial denotes the very first of something, while Primeval denotes something that follows immediately after the first. And of course, the word current denotes something moving in a particular direction, like the current of a river. A few other things before I give my theory on the primeval current. The description for the comet Azure sorcery says that when the sorcerer known as Azure glimpsed into the primeval current, he saw darkness. He was left both bewitched and fearful of the abyss. The description for the Stars of Ruin sorcery says that when the sorcerer Lusat glimpsed into the primeval current, he beheld the final moments of a great star cluster. Finally, the Founding Reign of Stars sorcery says that when an ancient astrologer glimpsed into the primeval current, the amber of stars reigned upon the lands between. So, the two aesthetic details we can ascertain about the primeval current is that it is both dark and contain stars. Based on that information, I deduce that the primeval current is the stream of life that emits from the primordial crucible out into the universe. That life starts off in the pitch black void of the primordial crucible and then is expelled in a primeval current of stars. I suppose that Selen wants to restore the current so she can not only examine both it and the crucible, but so she can birth her own stars. It seems that she understood the risk of coming into contact with the current or the crucible. In the case of the primeval current, she could become like Lusat or Azur, where their bodies and minds were replaced by glintstone. If she came into contact with the crucible, she would become like the misbegotten. The misbegotten had their bodies transformed by coming into contact with the crucible. Nevertheless, Selen felt that the risk was worth the potential reward. I say that Selen was trying to birth her own star due to the existence of the enemy type known as the School of Graven Mages. The Graven School and Graven Mass Talismans describe these enemies as the result of collecting sorcerers to fashion them into the Seeds of Stars, an act that is forbidden by the Academy. These enemy types are only found in a few places in the game. One place you can find them is just outside where Selen was imprisoned in the Witchbane Ruins, and another is inside the Raya Lucaria Grand Library, after you complete Selen's quest line. Due to her lack of caution in trying to restore the primeval current, she either accidentally turned herself into a star, or Renala punished her transgression by imprisoning her in the ball. I don't know for sure. Before I conclude, I would like to present a couple of theories regarding Selen's true intentions. She says she wants to restore the current in order to establish glintstone sorceries that open people's minds, but I think there's more to it than that. In regards to the Balls of Mages, as I just said, they were merged together in order to birth a star. Stars appear to be synonymous with transcendent beasts. This is true for the Falling Star Beasts, Estelle Natural Born of the Void, and the aforementioned Elden Beast. Maybe the heretical sorcerers were trying to do something similar to what the Nox and the other denizens of the Eternal City were doing, trying to birth their own gods. At this point, I am reluctant to put too much faith in this theory due to lack of information, but I think there's enough there to reasonably speculate. 
One other thing that I think we can reasonably speculate about involves the relationship between the sorcerers and the Crystallians. The sorcery known as Shattering Crystal says that some sorcerers revered the Crystallians because they quote, cleave close to the ideals of the primeval current. One specific group of sorcerers, known as the Crystal Cadre, were interested in the secrets locked in the faint cogitation of the Crystallians. Secrets which they referred to as the Wisdom of Stone. If I were to hazard a guess as to what those secrets are, it would have to do with how the Crystallians are able to live despite the fact that they are inorganic, made of stone, essentially. Because stone and crystal are inorganic, they do not perish over time. Or if they break down, they only do so over hundreds of thousands of years. This would make the Crystallians technically immortal, provided that nobody murders them. Another creature in the Elden Ring universe that is made of stone, to a degree, are the ancient dragons. Their scales are made of gravel. Plus, as I demonstrated in my aforementioned video on the ancient dragons, the denizens of the Lands Between attempted to merge their flesh with that of a dragon in order to attain immortality, just as the denizens of Drang Lake did in Dark Souls 2. In both games, it seems that the gravel scales are the key to that immortality. I will remind all of you that I could very easily be wrong on all of this. Given the size and scope of the world of Elden Ring, it's very possible that I have missed something. If I did miss something, I promise you that somebody will point it out in the comment section below. So just in case you're worried about being misinformed, make sure to give the comment section a quick glance. Before all of you go, I would like to show all my fellow Soulsborne fans something. In case you don't know, I have a Minecraft server, and it is totally free to join. Amongst all the wonderful creations people have been making in there, there was one in particular that I wanted to showcase. One of my server moderators, Radman, has been trying to create a Firelink Shrine of sorts that will teleport you to areas in my server that are inspired by levels in the Dark Souls games. There's the Crystal Cave from Dark Souls 1, the Catacombs of Karthus from Dark Souls 3, and more. If you would like to join the server and build something Dark Souls related so Radman can link it, or if you just want to join so you can build stuff, we would be happy to have you. All you have to do to join the Minecraft server is email your Minecraft name to maxdarrett at yahoo.ca. Once you do that, I will whitelist you on my server console and send you the login details. Make sure you are using the Java edition of the game, otherwise you won't be able to join. That's it for this video. If you like this video, make sure to give it a like. It's free and easy and helps me out a tremendous amount. Make sure to subscribe because there are many more Elden Ring videos coming up that you won't want to miss. Especially the next one, which I think will be my best yet. Until then, make sure to stay safe and most importantly, stay yellow.